Our Story Productions presents On the Road to Our Story, featuring a variety of programs that take a closer look at the organizations, businesses, and people located in the small communities of the Midwest. So get ready, for you're about to travel On the Road to Our Story. Bonnie P. Silage here, reporter from Sweet Swine County. My colleagues and I are excited to present a series of stories about our neighboring towns and counties, their points of interest and business, so take a look. Located in Owatonna, Minnesota, in Steele County, you will find Completely Kids and Maternity established in August 1998. With the cost of living constantly climbing and the movement to go green, Ruth wanted to help people save money and recycle too. Their mission is quality at affordable prices. With over 2,500 square feet of showroom, they offer one-stop shopping for your kids from newborn to size 16, as well as clothing. They sell baby equipment, toys, and books. These items are clean and checked for safety and recall. For mom, they offer maternity clothing and a play area to keep your kids busy while you shop. Although their store is a resale shop, they offer many new items as well. Completely Kids and Maternity specializes in special location attire for kids from infants to big kids at reasonable prices. With the area's largest selection of baptismal garments and First Communion dresses and veils in stock, they also special order flower girl dresses and boy suits and tuxedos. They purchase baby equipment on a daily basis, so selection changes continuously. The next time you're in Owatonna, Minnesota, stop in and see what you can find at Completely Kids and Maternity. I'm Jason Howland. Welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. Arthritis is one of the most common health problems in the U.S. Millions of Americans have some form of arthritis that leads to pain, stiffness, and loss of motion. Many of those folks are over the age of 65, but people of all ages, including children, can be affected by arthritis. Our guest today is Becky Ness. She is a physician assistant who practices in the specialty of internal medicine at Mayo Clinic Health System. Becky, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Well, arthritis is our topic today, as I said. Let's begin by defining what exactly is arthritis. Okay. Well, arthritis is an inflammation within the joint. It can cause pain, stiffness, swelling at times, typically worsens with age. Um, and the two main types of arthritis we'll talk about are osteoarthritis, secondary to normal wear and tear, and then rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition. So uh, what are the common symptoms of arthritis? Most commonly people notice pain or stiffness. There can be some swelling, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis or an infective type of arthritis, there can be redness. And the biggest uh, issue is a, a decrease in the range of motion. When you talk about pain for arthritis, uh, often is it a sharp pain or is it like a dull, uh, long-lasting pain? It kind of depends. People can um, experience a, a kind of a multitude of mm -hmm. types of pains. Most of the time we hear that it's stiff, achy, mm -hmm. kind of just sore all around. There can be sometimes when there's a sharp um, significant pain. Um, osteoarthritis pain tends to be worse until we start moving and get the joint moving and then it lessens to some degree and sometimes completely goes away. With rheumatoid arthritis it can be incredibly debilitating and last um, without relief with motion. You just talked about the two main types of arthritis. Let's talk uh, first about a little bit more about osteoarthritis. How common is osteoarthritis and, and what joints does it often affect? Well, osteoarthritis is our most common type of arthritis, typically affecting um, uh, older individuals. However, there are young, uh, younger people who can suffer it, um, especially if they've had recurrent injuries or trauma to a joint. Um, with osteoarthritis, the synovial joint, kind of the area where the cartilage covers the bone, gradually wears away after repetitive use and kind of constant contact with each other. This results in the bones kind of rubbing together. And at that area, we can get new bone formation called osteophytes, which are seen on x-ray. Because of those bones rubbing together, it causes inflammation and swelling in the area, which causes uh, pain. Most common joints affected can be the smaller joints in the hand, to some extent the wrist, but really the one we hear the most about is in the hips and the knees, and to some extent the low back. And is that uh, because those are more uh, weight-bearing joints, so they, they bear a, a lot of the body's brunt? 
absolutely. They tend to they carry us in no um, all settings except for when we're lying down. Even when we're sitting, there's some degree of pressure, particularly in the low back and the hip. So does the cartilage sort of act like a, a tire on a car, uh, and then over time it uh, it's wearing down and and that's what osteoarthritis really is, or is it different than that? Kind of. A different example that I give to my patients is if you have a chicken bone, mm -hmm. and the ends are kind of nice and shiny, and then the dog gnaws on them, or you're scraping the, the uh, meat off of the bone, and you can kind of see how it gets frayed and irritated and dull instead of that nice, smooth, shiny. That's kind of what happens. So uh, let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis. So that is different from osteoarthritis. It is. Rheumatoid arthritis is what's considered an autoimmune condition, meaning the body's immune system is starting to attack itself. And in rheumatoid arthritis, it um, affects the lining of the joint capsule. That's a tough membrane that kind of encloses the joint. And as the body's immune system attacks that, um, it uh, causes inflammation and swelling within that joint, and over time, destruction of the joint itself. So uh, why exactly is the body's immune system attacking its own uh, joints? We don't know 100% why rheumatoid arthritis. It, there's a number of theories out there um, on what can cause it. It is a uh, hereditary condition. Um, so you have a greater risk of being female, and if there's someone in your immediate family um, or like a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle who has uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, because it affects the joints, it sounds like arthritis, whether it's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or other, uh, that it really can cause a lot of complications in people's lives, especially with movement. It can. Um, as arthritis progresses and it becomes more severe, it can really decrease the quality of life, uh, make, make it difficult to brush your hair, do buttons, clasps, things that require um, small movements, mm -hmm. but specific movements. It also makes it difficult to change position, getting up, walking, climbing stairs, getting in and out of a vehicle. So uh, who's at more at risk for getting arthritis? Are there uh, certain people that just uh, are more at risk for getting it? Well, like I said before, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis, but to some extent with osteoarthritis, the family history, um, people who tend to be overweight can be uh, more at risk. If there has been a previous injury or trauma to the joint can increase the risk of arthritis developing, and age is a big one. Uh, and when you say family history, are you talking uh, immediate family, or can it skip a generation, or is, is it all random, it all depends? It kind of depends on the arthritis in the family. Um, there are uh, families where it's generation after generation after generation, and then there's others where it's kind of sporadic and it'll skip one or two generations, but it's still there. And when you say a uh, previous injury to the joint, so would that be someone uh, like for example, has a sports injury to their knee or something similar to that or a different kind of injury? Runners who have just kind of a constant impact type injury, um, lacrosse players, um, that type of thing. And then also people, um, professions like people, um, carpet layers, electricians, plumbers who spend a lot of time bent over, small mm -hmm. conditions, on their knees, hard floors. Um, people who work in warehouses who spend a lot of time on cement floors that don't have a lot of cushion can cause um, increased wear and tear to those joints. So uh, when someone has been diagnosed with arthritis, uh, how do you as their provider, how do you help them treat it? Well, the first thing that we focus on are things that they can do to help slow down the progression uh, of the disease and to some extent re reverse it, such as weight loss, regular physical activity. There are over-the-counter medications that can be used. Um, acetaminophen or Tylenol is probably the most recommended. Uh, there are some anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, Advil, ex um, Excedrin, Aleve, um, but those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications can interact with a lot of medications and aren't really recommended with other health conditions, so we recommend that you follow up with your healthcare provider before you would take any of those. Physical activity to help keep the joint lubricated um, and moving like walking, swimming, bike riding. Um, application of heat like a hot wet towel or a hot pack can be really helpful. And there's topical medications available over the counter like Aspercream, Myoflex, Bengay that have some inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory component to it. Um, Biofreeze is another one that's available without a prescription. And then there's prescription anti-inflammatories like Diclofenac that can be helpful as well. And all of those um, um, medications, should you talk to your provider before you start taking them? I would recommend it because mm -hmm. depending on the type of arthritis, the severity and the joint involved, there's going to be different recommendations on how often to use them or apply them.
So uh, what about physical therapy? Can physical therapy help? It can. Physical therapy can be really beneficial. Um, it can act as kind of a catalyst to get people moving and active again because you kind of have a coach alongside you helping you with what activities to do, how to do them, how often to do them. A one or two sessions with a physical therapist to show you how to do an activity safely um, to f prevent further harm can be beneficial as well. Because I would imagine that's often the problem with folks with arthritis is, is that um, uh, they make do by doing things that are actually probably causing more harm as far as movement goes with their body and physical therapy can probably help them with that, right? They, they can, yep, because what the physical therapist will do is the proper technique to do an exercise. Mm -hmm. It'll also give stretching and strengthening activities for the muscles above and below the joint to help with stability and to lessen the impact on that joint. What about surgery? Um, are there surgical procedures that can help uh, alleviate pain and symptoms with arthritis? There are. Um, you know, in-office procedures, um, they can do a corticosteroid injection into the knee to de or the joint affected to kind of decrease um, the inflammation. Um, but when those modalities fail or the pain becomes too great, um, we'll do a total joint replacement, most commonly in the hips uh, and the knees. Um, not too many of the other joints at this point have been uh, corrected surgically uh, in that regard. And when it comes to uh, joint replacement surgery like that, does that uh, eliminate the arthritis completely? It can in, in very many people. Um, the biggest thing with joint replacement surgery is you have to do the physical therapy, you have to stay active, you have to abide by the restrictions of how to move, how not to move um, with that joint because you can do damage to an artificial joint as well and that a lot of times causes more pain than it fixed. Uh, what about alternative medicine, things like uh, acupuncture, yoga, that kind of thing? Do those uh, help? They can. They can actually be very beneficial. Yoga and Tai Chi, I recommend to almost all of my patients, whether they have arthritis or not, but particularly to those with arthritis because, again, it's minimal impact, gradual range of motion to help with balance, stability, and strength. And then acupuncture um, is... Up and coming, more insurance companies are covering the procedure, but it can be very beneficial for the pain and the inflammation involved in um, arthritis as well. All right, so uh, what advice do you have for people who want to, uh, they don't have arthritis, but they want to prevent it from occurring down the road, or for folks that already do have arthritis, maybe it's not so severe, but they want to prevent it from becoming severe. Right, right. Probably the biggest things is maintain a healthy weight. If you're overweight, Work with your healthcare provider, dietitian, healthcare team in losing the weight, maintaining a healthy weight that decreases the stress and the impact on those weight bearing joints like the hips and knees. Exercise is very, very important. It's kind of a catch 22. It's mm -hmm. stiff, I'm sore, I don't want to move. But once you get up and moving and get that joint moving, um, the pain should lessen and maintaining um, your physical activity will actually help slow the progression of arthritis, things like walking, biking, swimming, water aerobics, water walking, those types of things. They're non-weight bearing because of the water's buoyancy takes the heaviness um, off of the joint and can be really beneficial. So you don't need to run a marathon or uh, lift no. uh, bench press 250 pounds. No, none of the, you know, don't be a weekend warrior. Mm -hmm. Don't sit on the couch or sit in your office all week and then go out and try and do, you know, mm -hmm. an Iron Man on the weekend or something without training, but just regular physical activity. Um, if you have a dog, walk it. Dogs love walks. If you have young children or grandchildren, play with them, go to the park, go on bike rides, go on walks in the woods. Those types of things are going to really help keep you mobile, keep you limber, uh, and keep you moving. So Becky, uh, here in the Midwest, you know, we have very cold, harsh winters, yes, and you often hear uh, uh, folks that say, um, you know, I know a storm's coming because uh, my knee is acting up. So can arthritis be affected by our environment? It can. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, warmth is very beneficial. So usually in the warm, humid summers, we don't tend to have too much of a problem. Um, as it gets colder, as the barometric pressure changes, that can actually affect the inflammatory response in the body, which is why people say, oh, yep, yeah, we're gonna get a storm, I can feel it in my knee. Mm -hmm. um, but the cold can do that too because it affects blood flow, it affects um, the stiffness of the muscles and the joints. Um, so it's not uncommon when it's cold, when it's damp, when it's raining, um, to have a little bit of a flare or to feel a flare uh, in the arthritis symptoms. 
And also, uh, when f folks do have arthritis, do they often, uh, are there certain times of the day that they may um, feel those symptoms more often? Like, for example, you know, right when they get up out of bed, or perhaps if they've, you know, been exerting themselves a lot, or does it just pop up whenever? Well, with rheumatoid arthritis, it can kind of be a constant thing because mm -hmm. it's actual destruction of the joint line because of the um, autoimmune process. In osteoarthritis, people tend to have symptoms upon um, waking up in the morning because they've been immobile in one position all night long, or if they've been sitting, playing cards, watching a television program, sitting at their desk for a long time at work, and those first couple of steps when they get up and try and get to moving around, or if they've kind of been a couch potato all winter and hermited inside like most of us have a tendency to do, and then when it gets nicer out and you want to go for a walk and do things, you're going to be a little bit more stiff and sore, but usually within the first couple of minutes of movement, the pain with osteoarthritis tends to lessen. And there is no cure for arthritis, correct? No, there is not. So, uh, so it's basically um, preventing, trying to prevent arthritis from occurring or lessening the symptoms or helping al alleviate the symptoms. Correct. Right. The biggest thing that we really try and focus on is prevention. So Becky, you mentioned uh, heat as being um, a treatment for arthritis symptoms, things like a heating pad or a, a, a heat, heat pack. Uh, can that be overdone? Can you give your body a little, your you, joints too much heat? You can, actually, yep. Um, I know they sell over-the-counter Thermacare wraps and those types of things. I'm really cautious of those. My personal preference is a hot, wet towel because it's going to gradually cool with exposure to the ambient air temperature. Really what the goal with heat therapy is no more than 10 to 15 minutes in any given application, too much heat, usually 15 to 20 minutes or greater, is actually going to cause an inflammatory response, which is going to be counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are all out of time, but I'd like to thank our guest today, Becky Ness, physician assistant from Mayo Clinic Health System, for joining us today on Speaking of Health, a great topic. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy. Get ready because our culinary expert and, dare we say, wine aficionado beyond belief, Betty Thompson, is preparing some tantalizing dishes for us on her show, Cooking It Up With Betty. In the midst of cooking, our dear old Betty does join her What's Cooking reporters traveling throughout our story country. Now, on this station and the web. Hello, Sweet Swine County. This is Clarice Plow, head reporter for Hidden Away, Not Forgotten. We have lots of people, places, and things to do. My team of reporters and I have been traveling throughout our story country in search of big stories in small towns. In Minnesota's Lyon County, in the town of Marshall, the cool family tradition of retail for men's clothing was born, and they proudly named their legacy Mr. Cool's Clothing. Joe Cool started his career in the family legacy after leaving the Army. Joe worked at Ed's Toggery, a men's clothing retail shop. In 1941, Joe bought the building where his grandfather, also Joe Cool, had owned and operated Cool's Tavern for years. Joe took what he learned from Ed and turned the tavern into Mr. Cool's, his very own clothing store. Later, Joe's brother, Lawrence Cool, came to work for Joe at Mr. Cool's clothing as well. At the age of 13, Brad Cool started working part-time at his father's store and continued to do so throughout his high school years. In 2001, Brad came to work full-time for his father at Mr. Cool's clothing. For years, Brad learned the trade from Joe and Larry. Eventually, Brad took over running Mr. Cool's, and after Joe's retirement, Brad became the proud owner of Mr. Cool's clothing and carried on the family tradition. The next time you're in Marshall, make plans to stop by Mr. Cool's clothing for the finest in men's clothing attire. Mr. Cool's clothing, Marshall, Minnesota. Get ready, because just when you thought you'd gotten the cockleburs out of your overalls, they're now on TV. That's right, this is one weed you won't want to pull. The Cockleburr Morning Show, with hosts who deliver a mix of news, entertainment, and information about the communities throughout our story country. Now on this station and the web.
There you have it, folks. One of our favorite stories. Now, let's take a look at another. Good day. I'm Connie Anthony, and welcome to another episode of Making a Difference, where together we continue to learn about businesses, organizations, and the people in our communities that are changing their world. Dr. Jonas Salk said, I feel that the greatest reward for doing is the opportunity to do more. Here are a couple of organizations that are doing more for their community. Thank you, Connie. And today we are not only going to take a look at an organization that's making a difference, but a person that's making a difference. Taryn Tumbleson. Taryn, welcome to Making a Difference. Thank you. Uh, we're excited about having you on today, and I know you do a lot of things in the community and are a very, very active person. Uh, I made a couple notes about what we already know. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. A junior at Martin County High School, active in volleyball, basketball, track and field. She plays for the Minnesota Star Basketball Program based out of the Twin Cities, active in band as a section leader, jazz band, FFA student council, the president of SAD and 4-H. She is a tutor, lifeguard, youth group leader. You know, wow, that's a lot to do. And I also know you do a lot of incredible things beyond that. So you're a very busy person. Yes, very busy. Now tell us a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. What is that? Operation Christmas Child is a Christian mission project okay. started by Samaritan's Purse and led by Franklin Graham. How did you get started? How did you get involved? I got involved by a family friend had mm -hmm. told us about it and my family started packing when I was four years old. Now wh when you say packing, what exactly are you packing? In the shoe boxes, all you need is a simple shoe box gift um, and in the gift you have multiple small gifts and you also need the desire to spread God's love. Okay. Where do they send them or what do you do with them? The boxes are collected at relay centers and then sent to collection centers and from there sent to processing centers where there are seven processing centers in the United States. So we're very lucky to have one in Minneapolis and from there they're shipped out to poverty stricken children around the world. And along with these shoebox gifts, the children are also are getting gospel lessons. Really? Yes, and they, that's where they're taught about and, Jesus. And you have been doing this yourself since you were how old? Uh, I've just been packing shoeboxes since I was four years old. Oh, just since you're four? Just since I was four. <laughs> so you're just kind of getting started. Yes, right. <laughs> it's incredible. Yep. We know your involvement in this program is not just local, but does involve some other types of things. Explain that to us and how that works. Right. So when I started packing shoeboxes at age four, um, since then I've been becoming more involved. In 2008, my local church became a relay center for Operation mm -hmm. Christmas Child, where we collect boxes during the, the National Collection Week. Okay. And my local church, Chimont United Methodist Church, has been collecting boxes every year since 2008 and collects about 900 boxes. Wow. And last year we actually collected 1,300. Holy cow. So that was a big accomplishment for our church. And so since then I have been still collecting boxes and spreading the good news of Operation Christmas Child and what it does. And in 2012, I became a coal relay center coordinator with my mom. Sure. Now, what does that involve as far as your duties uh, uh, with that pro part of the program? Being a coal relay center coordinator involves just getting things organized and making sure you have workers for the seven days of the week that you are open. And so that everything goes well, you organize the boxes into larger boxes to be sent out to the collection center, which we send them out to Worthington. And from there, they go to the Minneapolis Processing Center. So when I was 13 years old, which is the youngest you can be to volunteer there, I volunteered for my first time. And basically, at the Processing Center, you sort and you organize the boxes before they're sent out to the countries. Sure. What are some of the countries these are sent out to? Last year, our boxes were sent to Zambia, India, Bangladesh. Now, uh, taking this a step farther, I understand something else happened and involved you as far as some travel, possibly? Right. God blessed me with a wonderful opportunity to travel to the Philippines to actually hand deliver these shoebox gifts really? to the children in the Philippines. So tell us a little bit about that experience and how long you were there and such. Well, I was in the Philippines. Um, we had a Samaritan's Purse, Purse Youth team there and that was uh, 18 individuals where we handed out shoeboxes in various schools and small villages. 
So while we were there, we distributed boxes to over 2,000 children in 10 locations. Now, when you talk about the children, how old are these these, these children, Operation Christmas Child really targets just a certain age group of children, the younger children. Okay. So from ages 2 to 14, boys and girls. With living in southern Minnesota, was there a little bit of culture change in being yes. over there? Tell yes. us a little bit about the biggest differences you saw in their lifestyle and ours, besides possibly the obvious ones. Well, the people in the Philippines were very caring and very willing to accept anything that you said. They were like, the children were little sponges. They were very intently learning and listening to what we had to say in the gospel lessons and story and teaching them what the Play-Doh was and not sure. to eat the toothpaste and things <laughs> like that. Uh, how long were you there? We were there for one week. Okay. And uh, how big a group went over there with, with your group? We had some supervisors that were Samaritan's Purse. Um, actually, they had jobs with Samaritan's Purse. And then we had the 18 other individuals from ages 16 to 21 from all around the U.S. Wow. What an experience. Yes. So I was the only person from Minnesota to and, go. and what time of year did you go? We went in the summer of 2013. Okay. Very good. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, where you see your volunteering in this organization going and what, what the future looks like. I think that God is just really using me as a tool and as well as a shoebox to really get out the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and His love because these children have never received a gift before, mm -hmm. but along with that they're also receiving God's love. Well, impressive. Uh, now before we go, uh, tell us a little bit about what's in these shoeboxes, the types of things and such. In these shoeboxes are small, very little gifts, anything from hygiene items to school supplies to the stuffed animals. And when the kid just opens up the box, it doesn't matter what's in there. They're just happy to be able to open a gift. Sure. Well, very, very cool. I'm sure the experience will stay with you forever. Just incredible. And I'm sure it touched your heart. Do you have a story you could share with us, an example of this? Yes, there are plenty of stories that I could share about the different occurrences where I got to see God at work. But one that I would really like to share was at a distribution at a school called Fortune Elementary School, mm -hmm. where a small boy had told us that he would really like a monkey toy. A monkey toy? A monkey toy. And he didn't have a clear box or anything. He couldn't see in his box. So he didn't know what was in there. So we did the countdown, the big countdown after the gospel lesson, and he truly just prayed really hard over his box. You could tell he really <laughs> wanted this monkey toy. So at the end of the countdown, he opened up his box, and you could just see on his face that it was beyond compare he was filled with pure happiness and thankfulness and out from his box he just grasped, grasped this monkey toy this stuffed monkey and so he went up to the front and he told everybody that God had given him this monkey toy in his shoebox <laughs> gift and he was so happy to see it that is a great story and now some of these kids that do you ever plan to visit this part of the country in this world again and see some of these people again? that would be a great opportunity sure. to go back to the philippines um i'm not sure if i will i would mm -hmm. love to but knowing seeing the children for the last time take the last distribution i knew that this girl that i had spent most of my time with at that distribution i would never see her again sure but it was okay because i knew that god was with her and that god loved her and that she knew that now and that she would be better with God and knowing that God is always there for her. Very impressive and this is truly making a difference. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share with us? I would like to say that whatever God plants in your heart to put in a shoebox is that that's what you really should put in a shoebox. Whether it's 23 pencils or two stuffed animals, that's what God has put on your heart to put in a box. and. It doesn't quite matter what's in the box as long as it's appropriate, but the most important thing to put in a box is prayer because prayer truly gets the box there and gets the mission done. This Operation Christmas Child truly cannot function without the, the gift of prayer. Well, thank you for joining us today. This has been very enlightening, very impressive. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly making a difference. We want to thank you for joining us today. This has been Jeff Rouse for Making a Difference. We'll see you next time. We salute these and all organizations that are truly making a difference in our communities. This has been Connie Anthony, and we will see you next time on Making a Difference. Get ready!
ready because now you can watch the zany soap opera that tells the story of the citizens of Sweet Swine County who live and love as the corn grows. The show gives viewers a tongue-in-cheek look at life inside Sweet Swine County with a lovable cast of characters who bring new meaning to the word corny. Now on this station and the World Wide Web. Well, there you have it, folks. Thanks for joining us as we travel on the road to our story.